Yes, you know, yeah. he's got total control right now. And I can't say enough about him, you know. He, he, he gets the ball out so quick and his accuracy is, is uncanny. Uh, but his audibilization right now is, is what we need to be successful. Uh, both changing pass protections and, and also changing routes on the outside, going from run to pass, pass to run. So I'm pleased with that. You know, he's just, he's cool, calm, collected. <laughs> you know, there's certain kids that have an ability that they, they're going to play great. And then at the big games, they're going to be unbelievably great. You know, he's, he has that ability. You know, he just, he enjoys the game of football. Hello and welcome back to the Tree League Football Podcast. I am Dan Albano with the Orange County Register and OCVarsity.com. And I'm bo- joined by my partner, the veteran Scott Barajas, our Tree League insider, as we dive deep into the toughest high school football league in America, the Trinity League. We're recording our show on September 9th, 2019, and we are working our way toward a great showcase coming up this weekend at St. John Bosco, the Trinity League versus the USA. This is just the kind of uh, showcase that excites guys like Scotty and myself. And uh, one of those players is going to be featured is going to be none other than modern day quarterback Bryce Young, who we just heard comments about from his co- head coach, Bruce Rawlinson, to start out the show. Scotty, how you doing uh, on your return from... From uh, Arizona, where you saw a great show from Bryce Young and Modern Day. Hope you had a great trip. Yeah, Dan, it's a short week. Um, you know, I had some fun, uh, ate some good food, um, made the trip back Saturday morning, uh, watched some more football, college that is, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, then started breaking down our, our games. Uh, and in uh, in route to our uh, big uh, showdown with the uh, three Trinity League teams uh, with this showcase. Yes. So thanks to all the fans for joining us once again on the Trinity League football podcast. As Scotty said, and he is correct, it is a short week just to set the table. Yes, Santa Margarita plays on Thursday this week, playing host to Mayfair. Uh, Eagles looking for a bounce back performance. That game is going to be at Tribuco Hills. And then on Friday night, there's two games. Servite, another team in search of a, uh, of a uh, bounce back, is going out to Cajon, pretty notable team from 2018. And then Orange Lutheran is playing at home again at Orange Goes College on Friday night against Narbonne from uh, Harbor City, another n- notable team in Southern Section. And then, then the Trinity League versus USA showcase starts kicks off on Friday night with St. John Bosco playing host to uh, a team from Maryland, and then Saturday's a, just a great doubleheader with, with Jay Sarah batting leadoff in the 4 o'clock game against a, a powerhouse team from Georgia. And then, of course, the big one, Scotty, coming up Saturday, one of the best games, high school games of the high school year, uh, modern day, taking on St. Francis. What a match that's going to be, a uh, matchup that's going to be also at St. John Bosco, 730. So, Scotty, will, I and I will be previewing those games later in the show. But before we do that, Scotty, we're going to do our our week two recaps. We'll have our players of the week. There's some good uh, players of the week. I think we might have some some new blood of guys winning uh, some awards. But Scotty, let's start off the show with the man we were hearing about to start out, the young man we were hearing about, Bryce Young. You took it all in, Scotty. The Trinity League podcast, you represented us, I'm sure, very well out in uh, Peoria, Arizona. And that was Friday night. Modern day takes down uh, Centennial of Arizona, 71-21, to 21, and it was a record-setting night for for one Bryce Young, the USC commit. He threw for a school record. The, re- the numbers have come out officially from modern day this afternoon. 538 yards, single season, single game, excuse me, single game record for Bryce Young. He broke the record of JT Daniels from 2016. Bryce Young also tied JT's school record for most touchdown passes in a single game at seven. And then he set the school record with 31 completions, which is a a great number. Um, He clipped it by one. Believe it or not, 
the Orange County record is is 50 completions. I couldn't believe it, but that's uh, uh, Trey Tinsley, an El Toro quarterback, when they had their passing game uh, going crazy uh, not too long ago. Uh, he had 50 completions in a game, believe it or not. But there was a lot of other numbers uh, from modern day that were also really impressive. So like we said, Bryce Young, 31 of 37. But Cody Epps had nine catches for 193 yards and three touchdowns. And uh, Kyron Ware Hudson, he had 11 catches for 165 yards and three touchdowns. You get the idea. Bryce Young put on a show. Modern day improved to 3-0. They're number one in the nation with a bullet going to a big game. What did you uh, observe, Scotty? You know what? You know, I think the score caught everyone's attention kind of more so than, you know, what actually happened in the game or even the fact that, you know, Bryce completed, you know, 83% of his passes and route to that school record. Um, 83% you know, crazy. Against the gritty, gutty Centennial team. Um but despite that score, you know, that team never cashed it in. They never bowed out. Thus, why modern day kept the pedal down and played, you know, with their starters kind of midway, I think two series into the third quarter before it got to the running clock. Um, you know, Centennial started out, you know, 0, 0 for 3 out of the gate, you know, they're with their, you know, three offensive series. Um, and the Coyotes, they had two weeks to prepare for this game. Um, and on that fourth drive, they switched up their offense and they started running misdirection, play action. Um, and it kind of got modern day a little bit off guard. I guess they, you know, they, they ran some, got some big gains off of that. They, um, really there was five plays that led to those first 21, um, 21 first half points. Um, but after that, they couldn't really sustain any drives, um, throughout the night, and the closest that Centennial got was about the score was up twenty seven thirteen, and then after that, Bryce Young and his offense pulled away. They put up fifty one first half points. Um, as we mentioned, three receivers put up over a hundred yards receiving. Christian Dixon, you know, he only had three catches, but they were one hundred and forty yards, and he had two touchdowns out of that. Um, and then Christian Dixon um, was the lone man out of there. He didn't. I mean, excuse me, C.J. Williams didn't. Um, catch of touchdowns but he did have six six receptions for about eight almost i think 85 yards um but defensively uh i want to i think it was i want to say ray latelli probably yeah. was the catalyst for the monarchs that game um i think he had i had the stats like you said they just came in yeah he had uh, uh ray had i think seven total tackles um to you know including um four tackles for loss there you go. Yeah. So he was, he was, you know, he was, um, and he had like a, you know, a like I think about three or four hurries as well. So he was, he was, uh, uh, the highlight for the, for the defense. And then the special teams added another block punt and score and a safety. And, uh, Josh Hunter had the block this time and re and returned it for the score, um, in this game. So, you know, everyone's gonna, you know, everybody, uh, you know, I was kind of wondering, well, what happened to the running game? Why didn't they run? Well, you know, <laughs> I think they just, you know, Bryce was so on that they really didn't need to run. I think they ran for, uh, let's see here, they 57 they have, yards. Yeah, 13 times, yep. 59 yards. Yeah, so, I mean, that's about what I thought, you know, before, um, and, you know, Quincy did score a touchdown. Epps did have, like, a couple of, you know, longer runs, but they just decided – you know, go with Bryce, and and um, that's what they got out of this one. Yep, Quincy Craig, like you said, and um, another guy that did well defensively was uh, Rajon Davis, another outside outside linebacker. He had five total tackles, including three for losses. He also had a, a quarterback sack. So there's a guy that I think starting to heat up at uh, right about the right time. He played pretty well against Villa Park. This is a nice game for him. And, uh, you know, he's just a junior and he's a guy that I, I'm always looking to um, see how he's how he's doing. Um, so, you know, uh, as Scotty, uh, before we get our players of the week, I wanted you to share with the, with our Trina League football podcast about I, I thought when we were talking a little bit off air about the kind of reception that Bryce Young is getting um, and I, you know, the way that he, you know, the crowd kind of is gravitating to him. He's a guy that's really generating a lot of interest among fans nationally. Can you kind of give us a little idea about how he was uh, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, 
as a as, you know as a little mini celebrity uh, almost as a, a, a that the fans in Arizona, the out of state. Um, you know, fans that are covering, you know, following high school football around the country, they, they're really recognizing the special talent in these highlight plays, these jukes, these uh, fakes that are, you know, that, you know, Bryce is delivering. Yeah, you know, combined with the um, the documentary that they're doing on him, the QB1 documentary that they're doing, so he has the camera crews kind of following him around on top of that. Um, but the reception was, I guess, being out of state and you hear about him and you see the highlights and then you get to take it in, you know, live at the end of the game, they had fans from Centennial kids coming out of the stands to, you know, as he's walking off the field asking nine, nine, can I get a selfie? Can I get a selfie? And <laughs> nine, nine. You know, parents coming, dads coming out of his, out and shaking his hand and, you know, telling them great game and then they're going to follow them and best quarterback they've seen. And, and that's kind of what he's gotten. And Bryce is a very humble kid, so you know he takes it with a grain of salt. Um, but it was kind of you know it was different to see you know being out of state and having that reception. But it was one of those performances that was uh, un- kind of unforgettable, especially being like we said um, in another state. Yes. All right. So for our player of the game, I can tell all our listeners here is that Bryce Young has won the. OC uh, Orange County Register Male Athlete of the Week. I am, you know, and I, I think Bryce, I, I don't, I think we've been trying to spread out the wealth, but for me, Bryce Young's the pick this week after that incredible performance. Who knows if we'll see another game like that uh, this year from Bryce. This might have been just the, the perfect storm. They they unleashed him. Now everybody has to game plan f- for uh, for this kind of stuff. Um, who knows, you know, it could have been, a, that could have been his career night. So I went with Bryce. How about you, Scotty? Yeah, I, I had Bryce, um, and uh, you know there was there was the one play I think that he made that that even the official was talking about, um, and I everybody might have seen it where he kind of he eluded up uh, um, the pass rush, rolled out of the pocket, was running to the sideline, and I mean he looked like he was oh, running yeah. out of bounds, and yeah. He just, launched it off of one foot to Cody Epps in the back of the end zone on the money in stride. And, yeah. um, and that, that was, amazing. Was, and I think, yeah. That, so that, that, that just, that highlight alone, um, just, it was incredible. And, and my honorable mention, I, I you know, I'm, I, I went with Cody and Chiron for combining yeah. for, for 21 of the, you know, receptions, um, or 20 receptions for close to like 357 yards of those six TDs. All right. Good stuff, Scotty. I, we got it. We're going to stick with the Friday games because another another really intriguing game on Friday. And I thought it was going to be a great game. I thought about covering it for the register and I really considered this. And I was, you know, was the Orange Lutheran 17 to 14 victory over Edison. I thought this was going to be a good game and I think it lived up to the hype. And it was closer to the game that I was at, which was the Mission Viejo La Habra game. It came right down to the wire and Orange Lutheran won on a late field goal. Uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, you know, they won a game last year on a late field goal, a last second field goal to, to beat Santa Margarita. This wasn't by L- Logan Loya, but they won on a late field goal and their defense played really well where their, their offense obviously struggled. It was a low scoring game, but, um, Orange Lutheran intercepted three passes, two by Jack, uh, Barron and a late one by RJ, uh, Regan, who's playing really well, junior, uh, cornerback. So that was a big victory for Orange Lutheran where they kind of had a rally. Um, our One of our writers uh, who was at the game, Dan Errett, talked about how, you know, J.P. Presley gave a pretty impassioned uh, speech at halftime and tried to get his guys going and the team responded. And I think J.P. is doing a nice job. And Orange Lutheran, you know, for all the players that they lost and hopefully everybody saw Ryan Holinsky um, playing for, you know, starting for South Carolina, they lost so much talent. Hey, those gutty uh, Lancers, two and one. This was a quality win, um, especially with what they have coming down the line with a tough game against um, Narbonne this week. This was a good one to get. Uh, Scotty, what was your take on this game? Yeah, you know the Lancers probably were in a battle more than they, you know, most probably would thought um, as it took that twenty-nine yard field goal with forty seconds left by Ashton Logan to seal the win. But you know. Um, and then they had to basically score 
17 unanswered points in the second half, you know, to, to rally for that win. And then they also relied on those two two key picks by Jack Barron because they actually stalled uh, apparent Edison scoring drives because both of those picks, I think, were close to the end zone. Um, as Edison, you know, could have e- easily have, have scored or turned him into some type of points, um, but they were momentum killers. And then the Cooper Vanderhill added 169. Yeah yards and I think he didn't have any touchdowns but I think he had 95 of that in the second half and then Logan uh, Gonzalez you know because it was efficient 14 to 19 104 and a touchdown and then he connected with Tiger Bachman for a seven yard game tying score um so you know you had mentioned you know Presley probably had that that the uh speech and did you know if it was did did you say if it was second half or before the game or oh halftime halftime there you go halftime so you know that explains him you know you know getting those 17 unanswered points um um, for a much uh needed win for them excellent and scotty so i for for players of the game uh, a player of the game for in, you know, player of the week for Orange Lutheran. I'm going with Jack Barron for two interceptions in one game in, in, in such a defensive game. Um, how do you come out on it? I did went, go with Jack Barron too, as for for his two uh, momentum saving turnovers, and then more honorable mention was Logan Ashton for the you know kick in the game yeah. winner. Yep, good ones. All right, Scotty. I love the uh, always uh, got the honorable mention. Scotty always giving us uh, some quality uh, work here. Um, another game that was on Friday, which was pretty impressive, Jay Sarah, and especially the way they won it. We have a few things to talk about on this one, Scotty. Jay Sarah, 38 to 14 over Bishop Amon. I think you're probably like me. I'm not surprised that Jay Sarah won. I think talking to you a few times about this, um, you know, for one, we knew that there were some uh, injury concerns with uh, Jay Sarah, and you'll probably mention that in their in your report how they didn't have their top two running backs, including a you know that we didn't get the Cal versus Cal commit. The Cal committed running back from Bishop Mont didn't play, and of course, um, you know J, uh, Chris Street, did, you know Cal commit did play for Jay Sarah, but I wasn't totally convinced on Bishop Mont, and I think they're a D two team, uh, which is no you know no. Um, no uh, slight on them. I think that's where they're headed, and um, they're going to probably contend and try to win the Mission League, and there's there's no problem with that. And I hope all the Bishop of Mott fans are not giving those guys a hard time if they win Division Two, and um, it's not Division One because that, that would be great for them, and um, maybe they will win it. But I'm not surprised that Jay Sarah took them out. But what I was surprised with, and I'm interested to hear what you say, have to say, is you know, General Booty had uh, kind of his best game, breakout game, and – you know, it was very efficient. Uh, I think he threw three touchdowns. He didn't go crazy with, you know, you know, it wasn't like a Bryce Young, but I think he threw for like 190, 200, um, a little bit over 200 yards. Didn't throw at a time, but he was very efficient through those touchdowns. And he did that while, um, you know, Chris Street didn't have a huge game. Um, I think Sammy Green had a kickoff return, or he had the, a big special teams play, but for some reason, and I'm not sure why, Jay Sarah didn't really run it. Chris Street had a very, very quiet game rushing. He did catch a, a touchdown, but um, it was good progress for uh, for General Booty, who's, you know, that's, and I think that maybe that's going to get him going because the first two games we haven't been t- really talking too much about how General, you know, we haven't seen, we haven't been saying General's been lighting up and it, it's been, hey, Jay Sarah's got a, um, gel. They got you know. They are looking at new receivers, and maybe they're not that dynamic at receiver. What kind of weapons does he have? They're going to rely on Chris Street. But this was a good game for General Booty. What did you think, uh, Scotty? Yeah, it looked like Jay Sarah got their offense back on track at least for a half because they yeah. didn't put up those thirty-five. Yeah, right. Off first half, but they yeah. failed to score a yeah. touchdown in the second <laughs> half. <laughs> but they came away with three points. You know, Jay, Jay Sarah they jumped on Bishop Ma from the start. You know, General Booty did you know look poised for the first time this season, finishing eleven of fifteen. I had, we had him. I had him for one eighty-one and the three turn three touchdowns and no turnovers. Yeah, but. No but then he was 0 for 3 passing in the second half. So it's kind of, you know, odd, you know, a little bit more. I'll get to that in a little bit later. But, you know, but in that first half, he was on as he hit Chris Street for a 23-yard score with interesting. He put Street 
uh, in the slot, and he hit him, yeah. you know, because he was it was a nice over the middle. He was on the linebacker, linebacker couldn't stay with him, and he, and, and and he scored. And then the next came on a forty three yard Sammy Green run, um, and then the third score was Booty connected with a wide open Ernest McDaniel for forty one yards as two of my defenders got tangled and they fell down. So it was kind of an easy McDaniel had it, went untouched. Um, but nonetheless, it was a third, you know, his, uh, second passing TD. And then his third one, he hit New Zealand Williams down the sideline for 31 yards. And then, like you said, all that was in the first half. And then it was 35, seven at the half. And, you know, then I have to wonder, this is where it got interesting. Cause you have to wonder if did Jay Sarah, you know, take the foot off the gas because booty only attempted three second half passes and then we had taught you had mentioned Chris Street, seven carries on, you know, yeah. on the game for 30 yards, you know, but as a team, the Lions ran for 34 times for 206 yards with seven different ball carriers, you know, with Sammy Green, he was the high man with eight carries. And I know they've been banged up, but, and I didn't hear anything about Street because I've tried to find out if Street, you know, got injured or if they want to keep it low or they don't want anybody else to say anything, but that's interesting be, you know that he didn't have because they have pounded him with the rock I mean since he's been there and yeah. so to see that I don't you know and I know Fryer was on that game yes. and, you know and I don't know if you know a lot of the times when, when you know if people see like a kid's not out do you go find out well why is he out just sitting out or did he get hurt um, so that's that's interesting to figure out why you know if why they went that but part of me thinks is that they they wanted to to maybe get some other people in because they did run it 34 times with other, you know, different kids, even some freshman kids that got brought up that, you know, I've never, you know, we've never seen their names before um, ran the ball in this one, you know, and then defensively, you know, they were no match, um, even though they um, both starting running backs yeah. were out for a modder. Actually, I think Dyson McCutcheon did play and I think he did get hurt. Um, and so then he went out and then, you know, they just don't have the firepower or the skills to combat that, you know, the lead that Jay Saver, you know, worked up. So, all right. Well, I will, uh, and I didn't get to do it today, but I will try to uh, check in with Mr. Fryer tomorrow, and maybe I'll post a bonus small segment on Jay Sarah report on Chris Street if I get something good from Mr. Fryer uh, tomorrow Tuesday, as we do our uh, our video shoot. So, Scotty, the last game to talk about, uh, actually two more games to talk about on Friday. I want to. Dad, we forgot to do a player's Oh, call. yeah. Thanks, Scotty. So, yeah, <laughs> and I uh, we don't want to take this away because I think the player of the week for my pick for Jay Sarah is going to be General Booty. Is that who you have too, Scotty? And I did have General Booty. And then my, uh, my honorable mention, and this is an interesting one, Kenyon Burnett for being 5 of 5 on PATs and kicking a field goal. So it sounds like uh, the normal field goal kicker um, was out, and so uh, Burnett kind of filled in for that. So uh, you can add that to his arsenal. Wow. I know that's a. Uh, I didn't catch that, Scotty. Um, that's that's the Scott Barajas research there, because uh, I mean we already know that this guy plays receiver, kind of tight end, defensive end, and apparently he's a really good basketball player. And now you're talking about uh, some kicking. So what an athlete for uh, for the young Mister. Uh, Burnett. Uh, so looking at another game on uh, on Friday. So uh, Santa Margarita, they were out of state. They played Cherry Creek of Colorado. Went back to Coach uh, Brett uh, Brent Visselmeyer's old uh, stomping grounds in Colorado, but they got beat thirty five to ten. And um, it was a, uh, it was a, kind of a case of big plays. Obviously, as the ten points suggest. Um, Santa Margarita had a, uh, had trouble. They they racked up some decent yards and moved the ball. Nick Barcelos ran for a hundred yards, um, but they didn't have Cole Fulton uh, at at quarterback because he got knocked out the previous week against Mission Viejo. So and then the big plays kind of went against Santa Margarita. And they had a pick six from that passing department. They also allowed a kickoff return for a touchdown. And that's, you know, that and the lack of uh, real dynamic, you know, playmaking on the offense and gave up a couple plays. That was enough to drop the, uh, the Eagles to, to one and two. And, it, it, and the way I look at it, Scotty, and, and you know, I, I think it, it seemed like a little bit of a letdown game for Santa Margarita on the road. And it kind of makes sense to me why I feel that way. The, the reason I feel that way is I was able to check in. I did a story last week at, at Mission Viejo 
and I was working with the, on the uh, defensive line preview story for the Harbor game. Talked to Chad Johnson, and he said that that Santa Margarita approached the previous week game with Mission Viejo. He felt like a Super Bowl type game. He felt like that was their that was the game for South County bragging rights. And he said Santa Margarita changed up everything on defense, and they had completely had nothing on defense that they ran in the scrimmage and nothing at all from their first game. And he said they just totally went for it. And he credited, you know, Santa Margarita. They played great. And we they didn't, you know, you know, uh, Emission said, you know, they could have done some things better. And um, but so I could see that, you know, it makes sense that maybe Santa Margarita did let, let down after they had this big, um, you know, game what they lost to the Diablos, but played pretty well and, and earned some respect. Um, and then one of the bright spot, you know, for Santa Margarita was uh, Derek Wilkins uh, had another sack. He's a junior defensive end, and um, Chad Johnson was also very complimentary of uh, of young Mister Wilkins, and he thinks he's really good and loved his motor. So, um, and like we said, Santa Margarita on the short week. But any insight to this game, Scotty? Uh, you pretty much summed it up. Um, yeah, the Eagles were in the hole from the get go. You know, giving up that opening kickoff and uh, yeah. And on that next series, you know, they Josh Contreras, who was uh, actually got the start in this one uh, for in, in Colt Fulton, threw a pick, and the same guy, I think his name was Miles Purchase, the guy who returned the kickoff made the pick six. Um, yeah, you know, it was a you know, you know, he was actually he was getting he forced it, he was getting sacked, and he kind of threw it away, and the guy, and he was kind of, you know, threw it. There was kind of the guy was covered and he made a good play and and then they you know it was about forty yards for the score they right. were on another score and they were already down twenty one zero um, and then you know they would add three in the second half and then Tyler Whitmore he scored in that late fourth quarter touchdown um, and then Ard had a pick um, yeah second one for Mark Ard Jr. and you know that was pretty much it but you know you pretty much summed it up. Um, with you know saying that they were probably you know going on into this one an away game uh you know after playing that emotional game with mission viejo so and then my player for the week you know i i greg doyle i think he's been you know their defensive catalyst he had eight total tackles but six of them were solo uh so that's who i went with on okay. for player of the week all right good pick and I, I went with Nick Barcelos uh, for his hundred yards rushing, and a good bounce back from uh, for him too. Um, you know, Santa Margarita had a really tough time running the ball the previous week, so that's another bright spot for the Eagles. They did not run it well at all against Mission Viejo, and I was very impressed with the physicality of Mission Viejo. Um, their defensive line is all that, and their linebackers are tremendous um, because. I know there's a one guy that you're high on is Easton Mascarenas, and this kid David Meyer is playing uh, lights out as well. He is very fast, so they're there. So I can imagine what Nick uh, and it was pretty hard probably for them to run it against Mission Viejo. So for him to bounce back for 100 yards, I say hey, congrats to uh, Nick Barcelo. So we'll have co players of the week there, Scotty. Um, so last game on Friday, um, this past Friday, St. John Bosco. Uh, hit the road against uh, Liberty of uh, Henderson, Nevada, and St. John Bosco won forty nine to seven to improve to three and zero. Just like Santa, Mar- just like modern day, the Braves are three and zero atop those Trinity League standings in in the non league. Um, one guy that you know DJ was uh, very efficient and didn't throw it a ton uh, attempts wise, but really connected. Very um, well, you know, a couple touchdowns. And um, I think twenty eight point it was twenty eight to seven at the uh, in in the first half. So Bosco was focused on the road and took you know uh, took out Liberty fast. And Bo Collins had a, a tremendous game. Um, I think he had almost like one hundred and eighty yards receiving, four or five catches, and I think he had f- uh, four touchdown receptions. So there was a guy that I, another player that I know you're high on um, is high on Scott Barajas's list that you've. Uh, You've mentioned a few t- a few times, Bo Collins. So it was an impressive uh, win as you know Bosco just continues to roll, Scotty. Um, you know, and we'll see what kind of look they get um, this week. But um, another impressive win for uh, the Braves. What was your take on this game out in uh, out of Bishop Gorman? 
Yeah, so they they went into Vegas, didn't even break a sweat <laughs> even in the desert heat. So, um, you know, DJ, he was six of nine, uh, 290, five touchdowns, five touchdowns on six attempts. And like you mentioned, um, Bo caught four of them for 178. Um, and then Jody McDuffie had the other one for 71 yards. So three scoring plays went for 71, 80, and 67. The 67 yarder actually came from Rashawn Luke, uh, yeah. a rushing touchdown. And, you know, by then it was already, you had, I had 35 7 at the half, you know, and then Bosco added two more scores in the second half to basically close out the game. Um, and, you know, there wasn't really much on that. And I think DJ, he didn't even play. I think he only played the first half. And, um, it, it, you know, it wasn't much of a challenge um, for Bosco um, this week either. And, Long way to go, huh, Scotty, for, for, for that kind of limited, limited action, right? I mean, you go all the way to Nevada and, um, you know, yeah, it's part of a showcase uh, event there they had. But um, I wonder how the Braves felt about that trip. I mean, they're just taking care of business. But, you know, we've kind of uh, said that their, their non-league schedule is just not looking too enticing. They're not having any super great games. I know, you know, obviously we think Bosco's dominant, but... This is just another game where they played DeMatha at home 35 to 7. Played Don Bosco Prep, you know, at home, you know, um 56-21 and then now this game you know Liberty 49 to 70 and uh, 49 to 7 and and don't look now but the combined record of those three opponents that we just talked about, it's 1 and 6. Uh yeah. Don Bosco Prep has one game and either is Liberty's now 0 and 3. Um, but the combined record of their next two opponents for Bosco is uh, right now is seven and zero, so that's encouraging. Maybe these games will go close. But what do you think? You think Bosco is just like, man, this was? Uh, you think they were excited about this trip or what? You know, on on paper, when it, when they started, like we've always talked about these scheduling about these games, how it's hard to get you know for modern day and for Bosco to schedule these games. And I know that you know this is a national schedule, and it just you know, you can look at it two ways. Um, Bosco's that good, or these other teams just aren't as good as they thought they were were supposed to be. Yeah, uh, we'll know more of that. You know, like I see later on when they, you know, when they meet up with, um, you know, Modern Day, and even in a couple of weeks when they go to Hawaii, because Milani is actually five and zero. Yeah, and um, they're actually supposed to be the best public school in Hawaii. Yeah. I don't know how much is that saying because last year Bosco kind of mopped them up when they came out here. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just, it's just kind of, you know, like I said, modern day Bosco is that, that gap is just, you know, everybody's, you know, frustrated with, the, you know, they get these national games and, and, and they're starting to, you know, to get the blowouts. So, uh, you know, we'll get to the game preview on this one, but I don't think this one's going to be much oh, of, a, of an easier game. Uh, either so now bosco players of the week scotty um i'm going with bo collins who, who did you go with i went with bo as well okay awesome what do you think of what i know bo's a guy that you've mentioned and what do you what do you think of him as a receiver you know he seems to be that deep route i mean you see logan and 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 uh hudson get all the short yeah. routes and everything he gets is pretty much a street fade or a post so i i haven't seen a whole lot of you know, you know he's caught maybe a couple of comebacks, but pretty much yeah. he's your, he's been their their deep threat. You know, and um, he's kind of the modern day. He's the he's the CJ Williams, I think, right? Uh, yeah, but even CJ, they haven't really gone post and straight on. Okay, you know, uh, like they, you know, like he would be equivalent to almost like I want to say almost like Osiris. Same okay. Brown. Um, yeah, because that's what Cyrus did. But Cyrus was pretty much just that post, you know, or the back shoulder guy, and 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 then everybody else ran all the other routes. So, all right, Scotty, last game to recap in the exciting and interesting week week two, and that was I know a game a lot of Orange County fans were probably following, just like I was. You know, it's Saturday night, and maybe they bought the stream. I know a pretty good Servite faithful. All clad in white, made the trip to Bishop Gorman for the Friars taking on the uh, Nevada State Powerhouse. And I was checking out uh, Twitter and updates online. 
and still and watching a little bit of the USC Stanford game and and this thing got over pretty late but when it was all over it was Bishop Gorman 42 Servite 21 it was 15 to 8 uh, Gorman the Gales after the first quarter and then the game kind of got away um you know positives for Servite was uh you know sophomore quarterback uh Noah Fafita threw three touchdowns to um Senior wide receiver uh, Zakaya uh, center and um, the, and and center throw really showed some nice speed in on those. Um, there were some long ones where he kind of ran away from the Bishop um, Gorman uh, defense centers. That is so, and that's you know that's a big part of uh, you know Gorman's uh, game is uh, they're they're a pretty fast team. We. We we both saw Gorman play against Modern Day, and they have some good athletes. They have some good speeds. Now we didn't get to see that speed too much on display last summer when we were we were at, in Las Vegas. But you know they have some good athletes, and what really what Gorman ended up doing is they they ran the ball tremendously well against Servite, and that was probably the biggest difference. I think was I think Gorman ran for almost three hundred and forty five yards, and they had some good speed uh, on 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 Servite as well, and. Um, I, I thought, you know, I, I I picked Gorman to win, so I'm not surprised that they won. I think it would have been a, a more encouraging sign, obviously, for Servite if they were closer than, you know, 21 points, three touchdowns. And, uh, you know, we t- we talked a little bit about maybe uh, Servite had closed the, closed the gap a little bit with Jay Sarah, and I, I still think they can, they can still play with that game. But this kind of showed um, and against a really good opponent that, um, Servite still got some work to do, uh, spe- and especially you're know, wondering about how they um, how they're doing defensively. We know that, um, for example, Jay Sarah they're going to run the ball, and I'm sure Jay Sarah sees those those rushing stats by Bishop Gorman and saying, "Hey, we're, we'll, we're we'd love to uh, unleash Chris Street." Um, and we know you know Orange Lutheran's got a really good um, offensive line, and and Cooper Vanderhale's got you know two 100 yard rushing games in in three contests. And um, so, and you know, Bosco's got a, uh, which is the Friars opener, has got a lot of running backs. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, some, maybe, maybe Servite came back a little bit to earth, but it's not over. They're going to get a good look this week on the road against Cajon and, and see how much adjustments, but they got some work to do. Um, that was my take on it, Scott. I think it, you know, uh, it could have been better, but it's, you know, if, if they respond well from it, it will be, you know, well worth their experience. Yeah, you, you know, this one, like I said, was going to tell me where Servite is at. Yeah. And Servite isn't just there just yet. Um, you know, Bishop Gorman was able to uh, physically dominate them at the line of scrimmage um, with their sophomore running back, Cam Barfield, who ran for 209 yards. And he scored in runs of 10, 70, and 80 yards. And then wide receiver Rome Odunza seemed to do whatever he wanted. Uh, he caught 10 passes for 217 and three touchdowns. And then, you know, Servite was playing catch-up the entire game, you know, being down 15-0. And Noah Fafita hit Zedekiah centers, who you mentioned, took that slant, yeah, 80 yards to cut the score. Um, and then Bishop Gorman, you know, answered back, taking a 29-8 to uh, lead into the half. Um, the second half, Gorman scored on 45- and 50-yard touchdown receptions to Adunza. And then Servite, again, was able to counter those two scores with Fafita hitting centers for 50 and 54-yard TDs of their own. It's just that Servite couldn't get any consistency from their passing game. Um, even though Noah put up those numbers, he struggled. Um, he completed 15 of 41, one pick, and he only threw for 36%. So obviously they were getting after him, and he was being forced and rushed. Um, centers... You know, three of his four receptions went for scores, and he had 187 yards. Um, but it was their defense, Servite's defense, that also gave up a lot of chunks yes. and yards. Um, and I think that's maybe it's going to be the Achilles heel because I wanted to see where that was. And and um, though Gorman, you know, you know, I think is a lot stronger and better than what they were last year. I still don't think they're, you know, as strong as modern day Bosco and even and, and Jay Sarah's. Off. Well, maybe I don't know. That's going to be interesting, you know, because of, the, of that running game. But obviously, 
it says Servite defense because if if we had said if Servite offense you know could outscore people and they could get in these shootouts they would be yeah um, and you know and it would show that their offense that it's not quite there yet but um, you know we, you can't still can't count Servite out because they could still score um, on these big plays but they just got to try to get the consistency better. Scotty, did you get to see any of the highlights of this game? I did. Do you know so on those some of those pass plays that Servite got beat with um you know was it was it uh was were they was Bishop um Gorman getting behind their defensive backs were they um running away from Servite um combination um I I you know I'll have to look a little bit closer to see some more of the highlights I've seen some of the Servite highlights. Yeah, it was a combination. Um uh, Dunes is a big a big receiver. He's about 6'3". Uh, he's about um, 205, 210, um, and he's rangy. So, and, uh, you know, about, uh, I think it was Micah uh, Bowens, just, you know, he just placed it there. And I think that was Achilles, uh, Servite's Achilles heel was their uh, defensive backs. And the, and, and the size advantage hurt them too because both, you know, corners for Servite are yeah. both like 5'8". So, um, and that, kind of hindered in them as well okay well uh players of the game uh player of the game for this game i went with uh and i hope i'm getting his name somewhat close but uh uh, Z- uh zedeka uh zedekiah zedekiah good job scotty zedekiah centers uh was my player of the game for survive and that's who i had as well all right so that wraps it up scotty week two in the books Servite one and one um and, you know, the way it looks right now, modern day Bosco, 3-0 and atop the Trinity League in the non-league. Um, Jay Sarah, Orange Lutheran, 2-1. and Servite, 1-1. One and, one. and then Santa Margarita, 1-2. and two. So composite record was at 6, 7, 8, 12, and uh, 4, uh, 12 and 5 or so, um, thereabouts for the composite record for the Trinity League. So, Sky, let's look at this week's schedule and, and preview these games because it's an intriguing week led, of course, by the Trinity vs. USA Showcase, which we will get to. But we do have business coming up on, on Thursday, like I said, coming up September 12th, Santa Margarita, like we said, 1-2, um, and two, taking a uh, um, plain host to, um, let's see, Mayfair of Lakewood at Tribuco Hills uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, Scotty, I think this is a, definitely a game that Santa Margarita can get to get. I predict them to win. Mayfair is one and two. They're out of the Suburban League. They're Division Five. You know, I know Santa Margarita is probably banged up. Who knows? Uh, you know, we'll have to see if if Cole Fulton's back. Um, they're on the sh- you know short you know a little bit of a short week, but these next two games um, are real you know definitely kind of must wins for for Santa Margarita. They're at home. Um, you know, and I, you know, one in, in Mayfair is one and two. Any reason to think that uh, the Eagles can't get this win, Scotty? No, I, I know you never want to say you just go in and throw down the Trinity League helmet and say, you know, we're going to get the win. But this is cl- as close as you can get without actually doing that. Um, I, I know Mayfair is one and two. They they took a loss, opening loss to, to Wilson, yeah. Long Beach Wilson. They came back and beat Lakewood. And then lost last week to Miracosta. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, the strength of, I think, Santa Margarita can get this one. And um, and then and then next week they'll take on a, a, a I thought they started some, uh, started another out-of-state game, but I guess not. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so they'll get this one. Yeah. So the Mayfair score against Wilson's kind of you mentioned that one's pretty interesting, Scotty, because maybe some people are talking about Wilson, Long Beach Wilson might be the best team in the Moore League. Maybe they'll beat Long Beach Poly this year. That's crazy, but so that score that Mayfair lost to them was twenty four thirteen, pretty competitive uh, score. And last week against Miracosta, you know um, they lost thirty seven twenty six. So they're putting up some uh, decent amount of points. The best team they played was Wilson. Um, you know, lost 24-13. Uh, um, I like to think that, you know, I, I think Santa Margarita is better than Wilson. So I I think this could be, um, you know, you know, a decently, 
I mean, Mayfair can maybe hang in there a little bit, but I'm expecting something uh, around, um, you know, the Redlands East Valley victory for Santa Margarita, which was a 33 to, to 14 victory. Something in that range, I think, uh, is, uh, you know, acceptable, I think, in uh, for Santa Margarita. Like you said, next week they placed uh, stellar prep of Hayward coming down here to, to Southern California. Freelance school, they're one and two. And I think that's where Santa Margarita's got to get another uh, win as well. So that's so we're both picking Santa Margarita. Um, so let's move on to these uh, Friday games, uh, Scotty. And we'll, we're we going to start with the, uh, the uh, Our Lady of Good Counsel game. We're going to go right to that Trinity League versus USA showcase. And this is going to be the kickoff game Friday, 7 o'clock. Got Our Lady of Good Counsel from Maryland coming in to take St. John Bosco. Like we said, Bosco, 3-0. and Our Lady, they are 2-0. and So, Scotty, maybe this is going to be uh, the toughest test uh, so far um, for, for the Braves. You know, this is the second team they've seen from Maryland. And, you know, we already saw what they did to DeMatha. Braves won 35-7. I think Bosco is going to win this game. The question is, how much of a challenge are they going to get from good counsel? Not much. All right. <laughs> so uh, they're they're the, they're considered the number five team out of Maryland and uh, forty six nationally, but their two wins don't look very impressive. Seven to zero win over Charlotte Catholic, Uh-oh. and nineteen to seven over Mount Saint Joseph. Uh, so don't expect much from another less than stellar prolific offense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to do a, uh, much against the Braves. I know we laugh at, at this you know, only in, in, in because of of how the schedule has just turned out, but, you know, uh, our Lady Good Council doesn't have anything offensive like DeMatha did or even the other two schools. Um, they do have uh, four, two senior uh, star recruits, uh, three-star outside linebacker, Milton, uh, Mitchell Milton, Mitchell and Mitchell, uh, yeah. safety Jalen McNair, and then on offense, they do have a four-star uh, 2021. He stated, uh, he's the number one offensive tackle in the, in the state of Maryland, uh, Landon Tegwall, and a three-star receiver, uh, Miles Cross. So, And that's about it. Um, so I, I think this one's probably going to be the worst of all the games oh, on the schedule to Bosco's yeah. to date. Uh, that's my call. So. All right. Now the Falcons, like you said, fifth. In the state of Maryland, they are four-time um, state champions in ten appearances, uh, led by Coach uh, Andy Stefanelli. So, um, but I think they're going to end up, uh, you know, this, in the same similar fate, and we'll have uh, as the uh, previous out-of-state uh, opponents from uh, Maryland, New Jersey, Nevada have uh, experience, and we'll have to start uh, pumping up that uh, game next Saturday, which will be. St. John Bosco at Milani, um, uh, open division team from Hawaii, uh, division one, um, division one slash open. Um, so let's also talk about some other games, Scotty coming up on Friday. Um, a real intriguing one, I think, um, going to be tough, but Narbonne of Harbor city now home to former modern day uh, star, uh, Darion green Warren cornerback. They're pretty good. They've had some controversy in their coaching ranks. The you know ongoing um, saga with uh, Coach uh, Manny Douglas and uh, the investigation going on of uh, you know of you know uh, suspicious activity there at uh, Narbonne. All kinds of stuff in the news with that. But here they are coming in, taking on Orange Lutheran at Orange Coast College on Friday, uh, seven o'clock. Um, Scotty, what's your take on this game? Which uh, you know I think. You know, I think uh, I think Luther might have a chance. It's going to be a tough one. Narbonne is uh, two and one. Um, they're an LA City section uh, Division One team. Um, what's your thoughts on this game? Uh, no chance there. No chance. Uh, yeah, I mean Narbonne. They may start slow, but I think their speed is going to. Their athletes are going to take over um, this one. Um, I know they have their. They kind of. Uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, they were the top city section, supposed to be, you know, undefeated coming into this one as as Lone Peak um, took them out, and it was kind of a stunner. Uh, you know, like you had mentioned, they've been entwined with that investigation, um, but 
you know, something good came out of all of that this past week. They do get a key player back in uh, former St. Francis of Maryland, the St. Francis that modern day is going to play. Um, they get the eligibility of a back of uh, Treshawn Holden. Um, so he was, he was a transfer. He's granted eligibility this week, and he's he's a dynamic um, wide receiver, probably one of the top one, two receivers in the nation. Okay. So that's going to be a challenge in itself for, for Olu. Um, you know, uh, besides holding, you know, the Gauchos have weapons and bigs. Uh, that's going to make it difficult for yeah. the young Lancers. Um, plus, they're going to see uh, former, you know, Monarch Darion, you know, who's well familiar with Olu. Um, so, uh, Dad, don't be surprised to, that this one gets a running clock. Okay. Yeah, that lone peak of Utah team, which is 4 0, they did beat Narbonne. Um, 41 21. That game was up at Moore Park uh, late August, August 30th. Um, but Narbonne did open the season in impressive fashion, beat Buchanan of Clovis, who's a pretty good team, beat them 32-7, and then they uh, they ran rough shot uh, last Friday against St. Paul, um, 56-19. Were you to say, do you have anything else on this guy, game, Scotty? No, that's that's yeah. that's pretty much okay. it. I, I'm going to pick Narbonne as well. I, I I think you're right on that. Um, so keeping with Friday, uh, let's see what else here. Um, Servite hitting the road on Friday, going out to Cajon, which was, you know, obviously a, a you know, a, a superpower team last year, but they lost some graduates. They lost their quarterback who's now starting at, um, Arizona state. You'll probably have something that in your report, but this is, a, I think a big game for, uh, Servite, um, coming up on, um, Friday, uh, uh September 13th at Cajon, seven o'clock out in San Bernardino, um, well, Cajon is a Division uh, three team, and I think I saw them ranked. Um, new rankings just came out today. I think they were sixth or seventh in their in in that division. Um, they have some young skills still left over from the team that was twelve and two last year. Um, they're they're two and one right now. Like I said, Division three team out of the uh, the Citrus Belt. But I think this is where Servite's got to show what they learned, start to tighten up that defense. Um, I think Cohen has a pretty good young sophomore running back that they'll see. Um, they're coming off two straight wins. They beat Cathedral of L.A. 26-14. That's the same Cathedral team that's got a pretty uh, you know, good reputation for passing league success. Um, and they also beat uh, Heritage, a uh, good team out in uh, Romo Land, an IE team last week, uh, 24-7. Pretty, uh, pretty good, solid wins. Um, they they lost their season opener uh, on the road at Helix of uh, San Diego, twenty eight twenty two. So they played a good schedule, and this is a big game for um, for for Cajon and for Servite. But I think Friars, I think they can win it, and they're going to have to play well, um, and they're going to have to improve defensively to get it. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. They are going to have to uh, the play. Um, uh, well, defensively, um, I keep mentioning they, they're two and one. Uh, they're actually they have them at 54 in the state. So I mean, you mentioned they're high, they're higher ranking, <clears throat> but gone is uh, Jalen Daniels. He's you know now he's at, he's starting at court of, uh, at Arizona State. So that high powered offense you know isn't isn't there anymore. And it seems that they've gone to a running game with a sophomore running back Freddie Fletcher. Yep. And he's carried the ball 68 times in three games. So that's he's he's averaging about 22 two carries a. Um, a game, and as a team, they've only passed for four forty-five. So uh, you know, I think Daniels has would have gotten that in one game. Yeah. So they've kind of shifted the you know dynamics a little bit. Um, but like you said, that Cathedral score is kind of surprising because Cathedral um, is is known for for throwing the ball, um, and they have uh, Lucas. Uh, his name is. He, and my mind is is blanking on me on him, but he's he's a he's a phenomenal quarterback. Um, right. And for them to hold them to fourteen points is kind of surprising. So and and Servite's kind of that kind of carbon copy of them, you know, with their young passing offense. So you know we'll have to wait and see on this one, you know, because since Servite's had trouble giving up those big plays, yeah. I, I don't think Cajon has the same skills. I mean, you mentioned that they had some guys coming back from that team. Um, if they can shore up the defense, um, I, I think Survey you know can bounce back and um, you know win this one. 
Are you picking the uh, Servite to win? I'm going to go with Servite. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting game. You know, plus it's at Cajon. Um, like I said, they were, you know, super last year. Um, and, and especially they won some big games um, late in the season. And um, I got to see them play in the uh, against Capistrano Valley in the uh, in the uh, playoffs, which was the um, that was the semifinals uh, in Division Three, and they won a shootout game forty six forty two, and then they lost to Sierra Canyon in a in a close game. But um, they're pretty talented. I still think they have some um, players left over, like you said that you mentioned the sophomore running back. Interesting enough, they lost to Heritage the year before. Um, even when they had uh, had Jalen, so um, I don't know. I think that's going to be a tough game, and Servite's going to have to really play well, and we'll see how much they can improve after their uh, after a loss. So, Sky, let's look at our Saturday schedule, which is going to be two games. We're going to both be at St. John Bosco. That's going to be the epicenter of high school football, especially on Saturday night. Let's start with the first game: Jay Sarah taking on Milton of Georgia. So that game's going to be a four o'clock kickoff at. St. John Bosco. Um, let's see. Milton, they're one and one. Um, they are a big school uh, from from Georgia. They won 13 games um, last year. Um, so um, so for Milton, uh, they're the Eagles, led by Coach uh, Adam uh, Clack. Uh, like I said, 13 and two last year. Um, they were uh, when I say big school. There's so many A's on their divisions. They were the Georgia 7A state championship um, champs. Um, they defeated uh, uh, Col- Colquitt County 14-13 in that uh, championship game. They're basically considered the uh, entering the year number two team state in in Georgia, and they have a good O line D lineman. Uh, maybe you'll, he'll be on your radar, Scotty. Uh, o line D line Paul. Um, uh, Ticcio and a senior athlete, Jack Rhodes. What's your take on this one, Scotty? Yeah, so pretty much you summed it up right there as far as, you know, the, the, the seven, eight champs, um, that top division in Georgia. Um, and a little uh, uh, backstory to that, you know, beating Colquitt County 14-13. Going into that game, Colquitt County was considered a 21-point favorite. Oh, and wow. uh, Colquitt County had beat them earlier in the year. <laughs> and so they came back in, in – in Coco County actually had played uh, in four championships in its last five years. So that was kind of a, a, a that was a big, big upset they in upset. that one. Uh, but, you know, Milton, they've lost 11 players to graduation. And with that, uh, you said that you had them as a the number two rated team in Georgia because I got them dropped down to the number 34th team in Georgia. Whoa. And they even got dropped to 174 nationally. Okay. Um, and so well, I don't know. We'll have to look at, look more on that. But that's yeah. what I got him as. Um, they don't have any offensive guys returning. Um, like you said, they do have the Clemson offensive uh, offensive tackle commit, yeah. um, Paul Ticcio. He's the number four actually, or he's the number four guard in the in the nation by twenty four seven. And then they have they do return four other linemen who re- who re- earned all region honors. Jack Rhodes is their is their stud on defense he recorded over 100 tackles last year um but like we said all the skills and quarterback are brand new i, I don't expect uh jay, ha- jay started to get handled in this one um yeah, i think it should be a good game but i, I i'm gonna lean on jay sarah on this one i'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt that they've started to get their yeah. stuff together um but i wouldn't be surprised if and shocked if Milton could pull this one off, but I'm going to go with Jay Sarah. I'm also going to go with Jay Sarah. Um, big game for them to get. Next week, they're at home against uh, Cal Bassis. Pretty good team. Um, might be a little bit better. I would say Cal Bassis is a little bit better than Bishop Amont. Right, Scotty? Yes, yeah. indeed. So, so Cal Bassis is better than Bishop Amont, and uh, maybe Cal Bassis is better than Milton. It sounds like Milton's lost a lot and is dropping in the polls. I think what I was seeing was um, preseason um, rankings on um, on Milton and and you know, um, but you know that Calabasas team um, is looming. Uh, they're playing uh, La Habra this week, and we'll certainly be talking about Calabasas um, next week. So this is a big one for you know uh, Jay Sarah to get. They get this one. They're three and one. Have a chance to go four and one. Uh, the preseason um, 
game, and then they get to their bye, and they're going to take their bye before they open the Trini League against Santa Margarita. Definitely a winnable game. So um, this is a key, a key point in uh, of their schedule right now, Scotty, and maybe it's uh, it's really big that General Booty's starting to come into his own that you know, Jay, Jay Sarah can get on a little run. So the main event, Scotty, coming up Saturday at St. John Bosco, 7.30 kickoff, I have it, St. Francis versus Modern Day. Uh, St. Francis Academy uh, out of Baltimore. I got him on a, riding a 25-game winning streak. Um, I think I might have seen it at 26. But, hey, don't look now. Modern Day's all actually won 10 in the games in a row, too. Yeah, it's not as long as 25, 26. But we all remember what Modern Day did last season when they faced a team that had a pretty long winning streak against IMG, and they won a really close game. Obviously, Modern Day comes into this game really, you know, firing all cylinders, Bryce Young looking very dynamic. I got to think that, you know, the you know St. Francis got a major wake-up call looking at those highlights and uh, seeing what they're coming into. But uh, how good is St. Francis? Uh, you know, I mean, we know Modern Day is the defending, two-time defending um, state champions. But um, St. Francis, you know, they're from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, um, you know, and they're, they're ranked like second in the nation by the, um, the Max Preps. Excellent top 25 rankings. Modern Day is one. Um, you look at Cal Preps, you know, they rank um, St. Francis higher than they do um, St. John Bosco, which you think was going to be um, Modern Day's toughest game, but maybe it's going to end up being St. Francis. Who knows? Um, they were last year, they were 10 0. We talked about the big uh, streak that they're on. Um, they're three time defending, um, you know, MIAA um, Class A champs. Um, and they've got a great quarterback, uh, John Griffith, and defensively they got a defensive end, uh, Chris Barswell, to watch out. Um, this could be an epic game, Scotty. Um, what, what's your take on it? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, St. Francis is, some some call them kind of like the, you know, modern day of the East. Um, and, you know, they there was a... a a special on ESPN uh, 360 about how nobody wants to play yeah. them. They, you know, they they have guys from all over. Um, their head coach, you know, he's basically he kind of like you know pays for everything out of his own pocket, and it's it's just kind of an interesting story for even being you know being a Catholic school. But um, and they had to have to scramble last year to to find teams to play. Um, and they, and then this year they finally got their set schedule and it's pretty much, they travel all over. Um, but this year so far their wins haven't been challenging. In fact, they've no. kind of played some very suspect teams. I mean, they beat Miami central 49, 13, and they're supposed to be the number 13 team, um, nationally. Uh, but they've, that Miami central didn't look very good offensively. And their quarterback said, I couldn't believe it. He was supposed to go be going to Utah and he looked like he's never played quarterback in my, in their <laughs> life. Uh, so, um, you know, you know, but they have Miami central has won their last two games. Um, and then the following week, uh, St. Francis beat Simeon of Chicago 55, zero, and that was a that game was even worse than the first one. And Simeon, I believe, I haven't got a confirmation, but I believe they're zero and three, and they're considered two hundred eighty six nationally. Um, and then this week they played a American Collegiate Academy of Florida and beat them sixty four to zero. And this school is two thousand and four in the country and considered one hundred four seventy in Florida. So. I mean, with all that said, I mean, San Fran St. Francis is very IMG like in the fact that their offensive and defensive linemen are carbon copies of IMG and the size. They have so many four and five star guys; it's ridiculous to even list. Um, and despite the quality of their opponents to this far, they're more talented than IMG. I, I mean, at least defensively. Really? Um, yeah. So they have both. They have players on both sides of the ball with multiple D one offers. And like I said, it's 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 a lot of them. Um, you know. So basically, in a nutshell, what does St. Francis do? Um, they have a returning starter. Uh, he's a sophomore. He played last year as a freshman. Uh, John Griffith. But at this point, he's been kind of more of a game manager. At this point, he hasn't shown to be a pure thrower. 
uh, because their main offensive weapon, and he's been doing most of the scoring damages, has been uh, he's number twenty four. So I'll give out some numbers. Blake Blake uh, Corum, he's a Michigan commit. Um, the quarterback Griffin, he's thirteen. Um, so you know the offensive line is huge. Um, all five starters are hauling in offers, uh, and then defensively, they may seem they may have more depth than IMG did, led by Alabama commit, you said Chris Braswell, and LSU commit uh, Damon Clowney, who's the nephew of Seattle Seahawks defensive end, oh. Jayon Clowney. So, and those two guys, are, you know, are huge right there, SEC guys. So uh, that, that, that speaks alone. The linebacker core and the secondary all have offers. Um, you know, nonetheless, this is going to be a challenge for both teams. But, you know, the key for me in this one is – you know, can ND stop the run? Can they slow it down? Um, specifically, you know, it's going to be modern day's nose guard and, you know, the middle linebacker spots for modern day. Um, and though they won't have to contend with IMG's backs because they don't yeah. have that same skill set as yeah. Noah Kane and Trey Sanders, so that they don't have scary. to see them. Um, yeah. Um, the running back quorum, you know, he only may be 5'8 and 205, but he can be explosive. He breaks tackles. So modern day better wrap. Uh, they better tackle because um, they're not going to get many second chances with this guy. Uh, and we'll have to see if modern day defensive backs can earn those ratings over these uh, receivers. Um, they're not really, you know, they're not big name guys, um, but they do have, like I said, they do have scholarship offers. They are bigger than most of the receivers that that, that modern day's probably going to see because their top three guys are all six two, six three, six two. Um, and then offensively, can you know modern day's offensive line be able to contend with their rotating defensive linemen because they're going to go eight, nine deep? Um, like I said, they have better talent depth than IMG, you know. And then Bryce can't he can't do it by himself, um, so he's going to have to get help. You know, his receivers are going to have to get out of their breaks quick because the speed of the game is going to be accelerated real quick. And um, if modern day can win those battles, um, don't turn it over. They should win. You know, if not, you know, then it could swing the other way. Well, you know, that IMG game, I mean, obviously modern day, that was a great game play last year at Santa Ana stadium. Modern day won that game 25, 24, and they had to pull it out with the, you know, dramatic, you know, late drive orchestrated and capped off by Bryce Young in, in, a, in a signature moment, kind of signaled that uh, this kid's for real. Um, I mean, he had a, he had some moments against Bishop Gorman earlier, um, about a month earlier, but that was you know that was a big sur- sig- signature moment, and uh, they were only you know he was just getting started. Um, but you know, for you you think that for you that's amazing, Scott. You think they're better? Do you think they're better? Do de- you think St. Francis is better defensively than? Um, on defense than IMG was. Yes. They're also better coach. They're supposedly, <laughs> uh, and I've heard this from multiple P, uh, sources that they're better coach. So, um, then like last year, I think, I think if, if IMG just commits to the run and just <laughs> runs and does not throw the ball, I think they, 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 they probably could beat modern day. I think that's ended up what happening. Um, down in that game is that they kept throwing. And then I think modern day did a, got a couple of stops and then they turned the ball over and that gave Bryce that drive. That was the drive Bryce went down and scored on, and that was you know, the deciding uh, moment. So, you know, this one's just going to be, I think, just as, as battle, you know, tested. But, um, you know, and I know that they've, you know, all the modern day guys have been there before. So, yeah. and and I know, you know, from St. Francis' view, they haven't seen a team like modern day. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes, you know, having to play, you know, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just going to be an inter- very interesting game in which way, how, how it flows. Because, I, I mean, you watch these games. It's hard to get a gauge because you watch these games yeah. that St. Francis has played against these other teams. And it's like, do these guys tackle? Do they know how to line up right? You know, it's like, I, I understand, you know, you know, the, like the St. Francis touchdowns are – you know, like I said, Corum, the back's wide open in the flat. No one takes him, and he's wide open, <laughs> you know. And then the next series, you know, it's three and out, or they throw a pick, and game's over already, you know. So it's like they did. They, I haven't seen St. Francis really sustain 
drives. I mean, though, that running back, I think he's the key. You know, I think if he forced this John, you know, them to pass, because I haven't, you know, they haven't seemed to be a, a prolific passing team, though they, you know, he's kicked a couple guys on the slants. He's, it just hasn't been enough. So, um, as I said, I think the key, like I said, is going to be the, is, is, is that running game. So, yeah. Well, interesting thing when you start to, whenever you start to uh, talk about a team being a little one dimensional or not showing something, that is not good matchup when you're facing. Um, a defense coordinated by Eric Johnson. And um, they, modern day shown like they did in the finals last year against Bosco. If they need to stop the run, they, they, they seem to find a way and scheme things. They like what they have at the edge. Um, you know, what, but the, those guys are going to have to play well. But, you know, it's, it's like I, you know, kind of pressing you a little bit on, you know, how good this defense is by uh, St. Francis. The modern day offense is better this year, you know, than they were against IMG, and it's pre- it's kind of no comparison, really, the way it's turning out so far, Scotty. Because, like we said in last week's show, modern day's receiving core is superior, and I was a doubter at the beginning of the year. I, I was wondering how good this core would be, but when you know you- you're going, uh, you know, five deep, uh, they did not have that last year. It was Brew McCoy, um, it was Brew McCoy at receiver against IMG. That was the matchup. And yes, there was some uh, Mike Williams at tight end. I mean, you have to. I think you would agree with me on that. There, it was Brew against IMG, and now it's hey, now it's Cody Epps, it's 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 Ware Hudson, it's Dixon, it's Williams, it's Amora. Right. I mean, I think last year in that IMG game, it was that it was like they wanted to utilize the ball control offense. I know it was kind of tough. Um, and you're absolutely right because they have you know it's a different dynamic because they had the two backs and they ran like this week. You know, this game they didn't. They didn't run, and, and the, you know, I think you know it'd be interesting to see how much running they try to do uh, yeah. with the because they don't have the power. They don't have Kobe was very strong. Right. You know, these two backs are very quick, but they're not power guys. So I don't, you know, so, so how much they what they choose to do is going to be interesting. Um, yeah, you know, I know being one dimensional sometimes, you know, you know, can be tough. Uh, one dimensional in the fact that you know you you talk about teams that only can run and can't pass. Well, then there's the flip side where you can't pass, can't run, but you can only pass. And I know you know when you have a quarterback like Bryce, it kind of cancels out because if you if if his scrambling ability is so yeah. great, but he can't do it by himself. That's you know that's the other key too. Then so his receivers have to be able to get open and. And they were have so they were able to do so, you know, in, in, in that Arizona game when Bryce did scramble out. So now will these, you know, I would these uh, St. Francis DBs be able to lock them down? You know, that's going to be going to be interesting to see. It's, it's it's just it's just hard. All we know is they have speed and they have offers, um, yeah. <laughs> and 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 they look and they pass the and they pass the eye test. So, yeah. but again, you know, you look at it who they play, how they play. And it, it really hasn't, you know, in whether or not, you know, can they sustain that, you know, for a whole game? That's and and like I said, and my my biggest, no, I want to say biggest fear, just concern for me is that D line for modern day and that been the backers because I don't think, and I may get flack for this, but I don't think the D line and that and that nose guard, you know, inside D tackle and and one of the middle and one of the backers is is as strong as it was last year, and so. You know that's gonna you know you know either come back to haunt them or it's just gonna be tough to 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 combat. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm sure um, St. Francis is gonna watch that. You know, watch that game and see where um, you know, like you said, if they're better well coached, maybe where IMG um, got off you know um, off track. And yeah, it'll be interesting. You know, um, and I, I've kind of mentioned it from the beginning. I want to see how. Um, modern day runs the uh, runs the ball. How because how what kind of support are they going to give Bryce Young? And I thought in person that they were showing some pretty explosive um, run game against Villa Park. I know it's it's uh, you know not the you know but a good Orange County team. And I think they definitely um, showed if they were to keep um, the pedal on the metal on the ground game against Villa Park, they are pretty dynamic and they have um, some good guys. Now can they run? Can they do that against St. Francis? I'm interested to see. How um, Craig and Yetz and uh, uh, Luf, uh, uh, what's it Lafoa. Lafoa? How those guys do? And then last week, interesting enough, 
Bryce Young did have six carries for 28 yards, uh, was sacked twice, but um, he did run it a little bit, and that could be definitely a major X factor, especially if the game is in the balance in the fourth quarter and Bryce does have to take over, you always have to watch that scrambling ability. Yeah, and I don't think they want he wants to run, and I think you know he's a pure you know I know they list him as a as a dual threat guy, right. but really Bryce could be uh, considered a pocket passer. He just has that innate ability to, to run, and a lot of the times, in, as you'll see, he does not want to run, and he'll he'll wait out the play as long as he can, and that's why he gets sacked because a lot of people uh, talk about. Um, you know, a lot, you know, oh, he gets sacked or he gets because he a lot of the times is he's either waiting, 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 and then he gets out of his break, and so a lot of the sacks are sometimes a you know a, a coverage sack rather than a sack on 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 him because he's looking to get the ball down the field. So I mean, he doesn't want him. You know, like I said, if you run, he has to run, but most of the time he'll wait to the very last minute. So. Well, it's going to be a great theater and a great game, anticipated game. I think it's good for high school football. You get to see, you know see these teams collide. Modern day IMG that sold out that uh, Santa Ana Bowl last year. A lot of people were excited to see IMG. People had heard about them, um, seen them a little bit uh, around the area, but never again, never against Modern Day, and that was end up being a one off, one and only type game. And then modern day after this one, it's it's you know the gauntlet continues. This this uh, they're going to be on a short week. I don't know which day they're taking off for St. John's of Washington D.C., but that's a f- Friday, um, the twenty seventh. Um, but they get a buy, so that's the big. Actually, I'm sorry, that's they're not on a short week, so they have their buy after this one. That probably tells you the way they scheduled this is that Rollinson's looking at this game as a big one, and then they're taking their buy, and then they don't play against uh, they have, until the twenty seventh of September. Yeah, and I, I think it just it came it. They wanted to take their buy the you know the the week going into Trinity League. That's always been yeah, but it just didn't work out with that way with having taken that last game to to St. John's. But and like you said, but they get the buy in between. So, um, and and St. John's already has a loss. They actually lost last week. They got upset yes, they did. four to thirteen against uh, St. Joseph's Prep from Pennsylvania, who is actually you know I don't know if they were they, I think they were ranked but they weren't highly ranked so uh, but that was kind of a shocker. That was a shocker, and they've come their rankings gone way down, and you know and, and the last thing Scotty about this game and and uh, enjoyed going in depth with you as always. I mean, is there really a lot of pressure on Modern Day where you know obviously the rivalry with Bosco kind of frames everything, but if they want to win a third straight national title, they might need to win this game. Um, do, what do you what do you think about the pressure level? Where, hey, you know, they still have another month from more than a month from now. They they're going to be back at the same stadium taking on St. John Bosco on October twenty fifth, and then they're going to try to win CIF um, against Bosco most likely too. But do you think they're you know this is a game where they're going to get up and they're going to feel pressure? Or are they going to be you think they'll be cool because of their experience? Um, you know, this is, a, I mean, with the exception of the, the offensive line and Bryce, it's a pretty young, still kind of a, as a young team, although a lot of them have been played in the IMG game. Um, you know, you also look at, you know, the other question is, has modern day been tested, you know, because the centennial, Right. Centennial and you know obviously Villa Park. Park, so you could also say that you know because they haven't seen anybody in, in that caliber either, but they have played IMG. Um, uh, you know, as far as everything else, as far as being, you know, they're obviously going to be up, but uh, I don't, I don't think that it's going to, you know, it, it's just going to come down to those, you know, I think those those X's and O's that we talked about. Yeah, and Centennial, by the way, dropped a game uh, last week too. Uh, lost one to Cathedral Catholic, uh, 44-41. And you know, I I brought up uh, Bosco's the record of their composite uh, record, and you know, for modern day, it's it's nothing too crazy. Their their opponents, you know, in all fairness, you know, three and four. But I still think Centennial well coached, Ville Park well coached. You know, uh, Arizona team pretty good on the road, so I think they played a, a good schedule. So, um, Scotty, it's going to be a great game out there Saturday. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing you out there. 
Uh, it's going to be uh, a nice uh, Saturday uh, with the JCR game before that and then this one in the evening. So Yeah, so you guys uh, on the Tree League Football Podcast, you know we're going to be coming back with a lot of information because we're going to take in at least two games on Saturday um, with JCR Insight and um, Modern Day Insight. So, Scotty, great job as always. All right. Thank you, Dan. And for Scott Barajas, I'm Dan Albano, and thanks again for listening to us on the Tree League Football Podcast.